Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted, you should listen to all of the episodes as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Don Bishop, who just retired as the Associate Vice President for Undergraduate Enrollment at the University of Notre Dame. Don, so great to see you here today. How are you? John, I'm doing just great. Thanks for having me. It is our honor and our pleasure. So tell us about yourself. I know you just recently retired, but tell us about your journey when it comes to the world of admissions. Great. Well, you know, I came to Notre Dame as a freshman in 1973 from Portland, Oregon. And my freshman roommate was from Red Bank, New Jersey. He talked like this all four years. <laughs> but the first thing he said to me when he met me is, why are you from Oregon? Uh, not why did you come from Oregon, just why are you from Oregon? Because D New Yorkers kind of view that Notre Dame's their place. And, and I, I loved him. He was best man at my wedding, godfather to my son. So we certainly got along. Uh, but I will say that, you know, my journey, uh, I came from the West Coast. I wanted a national university, and boy, did I get that experience at Notre Dame. But <laughs> I had planned to go out and work back on the West Coast right after graduating. And the day after graduation, Notre Dame's provost called me in and said, why don't you stay and work in admissions for a couple years, and then you can go get a real job. <laughs> and, and so I started admissions at Notre Dame, did it for eight years till 1985, became dean at Ohio Wesleyan University. Uh, we got a lot of East Coasters there, did that for nine years. And then I went to Cornell University as the head of enrollment for the hotel school. If you don't know, Cornell has seven different colleges and each has their own admissions selection committees. And so I, I ran the, the entrepreneurial business school, hotel school there. And then I was vice president at Creighton for seven years and Embry Riddle Aeronautical for two years down in Daytona Beach because I wanted to start retiring youngish. And then Notre Dame 12 years ago called me and ruined my life and made me come back <laughs> here. But I, it's been an absolute pleasure being the head of enrollment at Notre Dame my alma mater. So it's, I've gotten to see five very different universities with different admission situations, different kind of uh, perception of themselves and different benefits for the students. So I've really enjoyed that journey. Well, we really appreciate that introduction and it makes me even more excited to continue with this conversation. So Don, I'm going to start with an obvious question. What is it about the University of Notre Dame that makes it so appealing? For so many students to want to apply and ultimately attend. Yeah, it's, you know, again, it's it's a real honor uh, to represent Notre Dame because so many people see Notre Dame in the way that we do. And if you don't see Notre Dame, we do. Uh, you know, we're we're happy to try to explain what Notre Dame is. <laughs> but boy, there are a lot of people that think they already see some things about Notre Dame that are attractive. Um, I'd say a couple things. One, and I mentioned it at the start, we're the most national private university in the United States. As far as if you look at our 
spread of where our Americans come from, uh, about 38% of the Americans come from the East Coast and Southeast, about 32% from the Midwest, about 30% from the West Southwest uh, of the Americans, and about probably 12% of our students are either U.S. students abroad or, or international students abroad. Uh, so first of all, I just think it's a big adventure where you meet people from everywhere. Uh, secondly, Notre Dame is really set up differently than the other top 15 schools and that as selective as we are and the academics are great, and we'll, I'm sure we'll go through that a little bit more detail later, but Notre Dame has an equal dedication to kind of your formation as a human being. So we're trying to make you as smart as we can and get you super smart and ready to go in any field you want to become an expert on. But also, regardless of that, we're really making you take time. And a lot of times you're, you don't have to be encouraged you like that Notre Dame is also going to talk to you about becoming more of a kind of a version of yourself that's a better human being. And so the fact that we're the leading Catholic university in the world, um, and whether you're Catholic or any other religion, or even if you don't have a religion, but you believe in the spirituality of that, Notre Dame has a very special uh, benefit that you just don't get anywhere else. So, you know, I, I would start with that. The other thing is we're more focused on undergraduate education. So a lot of our students, our overlap sometimes is with Williams, Amherst, Carleton, uh, Swarthmore, uh, we're not just a large research university. We, we actually, while we're the third largest among the top 15 in the size of undergraduates, we're about 2,050 first year students, but we're actually, we don't have grad students teaching, a lot more access and time spent with, with uh, tenured faculty. So, and then finally, I would say the residential nature of the campus, we're not in a big city. Uh, we all come here from everywhere, but we come together very easily. And we do believe in, in trying to be supportive of each other. So the friendliness, the sense of community in the residence halls, you live in the same hall for your first three years. If you wanna stay there for the fourth year, you can, or you can move off if you want, but you don't really move around. So that residence hall becomes your family. And yet it's not a fraternity sorority system there's no competition, social competition on campus. You, you are randomly assigned a hall and you are randomly assigned that freshman roommate. So I got fairly randomly assigned a New Jersey roommate freshman year being from Oregon. Uh, I met my wife at Notre Dame. She was from Nashville, Tennessee, met her in Chem Lab and her roommates were from LA and Minneapolis. But the hall life uh, is actually like a family environment. So you have your academics, you have your hall life, and that continues to kind of reinforce the strength of what Notre Dame's trying to do in formation. Well, we appreciate that comprehensive answer. I thought it was very interesting how you explained that you have basically even distribution between the east side of the country, the west side of the country, and of course, the middle of the country. So that was great data that you shared with us. Another statistic that I read, which is astonishing, is that 98%, 98% of your freshman class remains, which is a testament to the great work you do in admissions to find the right students to attend your school. But then it's the great work that you do on campus to foster that sense of community and family to keep the students, frankly, very happy and wanting to you know, return year after year. So Don, what can you tell us about life on campus outside of the classroom and even life outside of the campus itself? Yeah, so part of what Nerd Aim's trying to do is to open you up to a much larger world that you're gonna live in after college. So in high school, you have your classes that you take, you're, you're concerned about getting the best grades and getting um, prepared to go to college, but we're trying to prepare you for life. So we're not trying to just prepare you for the next four years after Notre Dame. So uh, there's a lot of uh, speakers that come to campus, a lot of leadership and service opportunities. Uh, there certainly is the, the diversion of the entertaining sports on campus. Um, obviously football at Notre Dame is legendary, but you know the women's sports actually have been world-class in their competitions as have some of the other men's sports. Uh, so you know there's a lot for 
entertainment. Also, we do a lot. We run a homeless shelter in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, you know, New Yorkers might not think this is very large, but South Bend has about 200,000 people in the greater you know, MSA area, around 30 mile radius uh, across, you know, from, from the campus. So uh, there's actually a lot of pretty high level needs in the area that our students will work with faculty. We also try to build incubator companies to solve local problems, whether those are nonprofit or creating and launching companies. So out of 8,900 undergraduates, we actually have over a thousand of our students are part of Innovation Park and the Idea Center, where we're creating organizations. And some of our seniors are actually taking a year out to do IPOs on their companies. One of my seniors uh, created an IPO for over 20 million during his senior year. And he did that and graduated on time, but he hired three students that had to step out for a year to get everything set up for the IPO. And then I'm the head of enrollment, so I had to approve their departure and tell them they could come back. And, you know, I so I think, and then there's the spiritual life on campus, if, if you are focused on developing that. 75% uh, of our students do a study abroad experience, some of them multiple. Uh, we're one of the top five probably in the country for the percentage of our students that do a study abroad or a community service uh, abroad project or a, a corporate internship abroad. So, or research, a lot of research abroad. Uh, so there's a lot going on. The question is outside of your classroom performance, what do you want to think about? What do you want to do? What kind of gives you joy? What kind of is making you into uh, a more interesting and interested person? And that might be activities. It, it might be academic areas. It might be service, and you're around a lot of students with a lot of energy. So you also get influenced by the faculty and other students. So I started being interested in certain things, but boy, did I get involved in a lot of other things because of roommates, faculty, or classmates suggesting, oh, you ought to do this or that. Uh, I, senior year, wanted to raise money for charity. That was my roommates were all into helping uh, low income families and also students with uh, physical handicaps. To be honest, I wasn't tough enough to do that. I, I, I found that really challenging emotionally. So I said, well, I'll just raise money for your organizations. And uh, a couple of Nerd Aid people had set this stuff up over the years. They said, well, why don't you run uh, Mardi Gras your senior year? You're good at organization. So I ran for 10 days a gambling casino on campus. And in today's <laughs> dollars, we raised over $300,000. Wow. And I, I That's managed awesome. an organization of about 1,000 people for almost a year to pull that off. And I would have never have thought of doing that. But Notre Dame kind of does things in a big way. Uh, we have the largest uh, basketball tournament on a college campus. I think we have over uh, a thousand or maybe actually over 1500 basketball teams that play a single elimination tournament. Sport, Sports wow. Illustrated covered it on a three page uh, article when I was a student here. So Notre Dame <laughs> tries to do big things and pulls you into dreaming big and doing big. So um, it's fun. And then you still have the, you know, the birthday party with your uh, roommate uh, that you're surprising him with. And so you do small things that are really fun, too. I want to welcome back Sean Patel, who is the founder and CEO of Prep Expert. He's a Shark Tank entrepreneur making a deal with Mark Cuban back in 2016. And he's also a board certified dermatologist who received a perfect score on his SAT. Sean, welcome back. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back, John. So I just wanted to share with all your listeners real quick that we have an amazing partnership with the College Admissions Process Podcast, and we have a really special offer for all of your listeners. So for any listener who wants to enroll their student into one of our prep expert SAT courses, ACT courses, or one-on-one -on -one tutoring programs, you can get 30% off just for being a listener of the College Admissions Process Podcast. All you need to do is put in the promo code COLLEGETALK, 
one word, just college talk, and that'll give you 30% off all prep expert SAT courses, ACT courses, or one on one tutoring packages. Make sure you use the link in the show notes of the College Admissions Process Podcast. Thank you, Sean. We really appreciate it. To our listeners, as an affiliate partner with Prep Expert, I want to be transparent with you that for every purchase made using our coupon code, which is College Talk, the College Admissions Process Podcast will receive a small commission from Prep Expert. But rest assured that we only promote programs that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. So whether you're preparing for the SAT, ACT, or need a one on one tutor, Prep Expert has the tools and expertise to help you. For more information, please see the Prep Expert affiliate partnership link in the show notes. And now let's get back to the show. Don, how many applications do you review a year? And of course, any insight that you give us into the overall process would be appreciated. Yeah. So this past year, we received 26,509 applicants. Wow. Of those, I personally, in some form, probably reviewed over 5,000 of them. Wow. Now, <laughs> I have a team. I, we have about 50 staff that read applications. Uh, some of those are part-time people that used to work for us, and they're in grad school or they're, they've started families, they're at home, but they, they're willing to work part-time, or they're retired faculty or retired administrators, um, or former high school administrators that, whether they're Notre Dame grads or not, we, we train them up on Notre Dame. But we have probably about 25 in-house readers and probably about 30 or 40 out, outside part-time readers. But you know, of those 5,000, what I tend to do is I've organized during my 45-year career, I've done a lot of research on how do you get better at knowing who's going to be successful, not just who's been successful in high school, but who's going to succeed in Wyatt College, who's going to succeed in 10, 20, 30 years out. So we've done a lot of research and generally, I use numbers to prove that people have overused numbers to make decisions. And I have the numbers to prove to you that you're overusing the numbers. And then I actually use numbers to reorganize the reading process. So we, we try to cluster students into kind of performance areas or kind of key attributes that we find attractive. And then instead of arguing over who has the highest test score or grades, we're more inclined to, at that point, uh, just put them in a group and stop talking about their numbers. And we just talk to them about as human beings and as scholars, learners. We're as interested in your motivation for your success as how much success you've had. In fact, if we could ever develop uh, a better applicant system in America, I think the motivation for people is more important than their, just their raw talent. Uh, both are important. But um, so when I'm reviewing files, I'm looking at probably over 50 to 60 attributes that a student might have. And I'm because I'm the ultimate head of enrollment, I'm the final determination on, OK, these are the best people of this cluster. And do we have enough of these students to make a kind of a critical mass on campus of entrepreneurs, of community service, of leaders, of scholars that are really into physics, uh, women in business entrepreneurs, uh, women in engineering. So we're looking at a lot of attributes and trying to fill a lot of profiles. And in the end, I'm the final judge with the director admission. So the staff has read all these files, recommended, the committees have read them, recommended. But at the end, I probably see about 5,000 uh, of those, about a thousand of the ones I've seen, I approved for admission, probably a thousand which the committee had asked for admission. We decide to put on the wait list instead of admit them. And then there's always some that everybody thought they should be admitted and I disagreed, uh, or everybody else thought they should be turned down and I disagreed and, and admitted them. So uh, I think we're pretty holistic and entrepreneurial. But uh, to get through 26,500 files, one person can't read all of them, right? Absolutely. And that is an amazing overview of your process. 
but not only the admissions process, but even the thought process that goes behind it. So I can't thank you enough for that, Don. And I know that Notre Dame is obviously highly academic. What is the average profile of the current freshman class, obviously in terms of things that you collect, such as the GPA, SAT, or ACT score? I'll start with class performance because that's the single most important factor when, when we go in. I'd say we've done research on students' grade point achievement at college. And most of this research I did at Cornell and Notre Dame, but also at Creighton. Also, the University of California system's done the same type of research. We're all getting around the same results. Class performance statistically predicts about 30% of your GPA variance between your uh, GPA and another student's GPA at your college based upon the variance in high school of your GPA. Same thing would be of your testing. That how much of the variance between one score and another predicts the variance in GPA at, at college? Now, you're not just trying to admit the people that will have the highest GPA, but it's a good start, right, for, for college. And so all colleges are very interested. But I would say that academically, the profile would, uh, the, the median student, so the person is right in the middle of the class in high school was probably in the top one or two percent of their high school class. Now, if you go to a tougher high school where there's a lot more competition, we also evaluate the density of talent at your high school. We evaluate the class rigor that you took. Did you take the tougher courses? Now, we've got to be careful with that. It should not be an arms race where your students and parents think, oh, then the solution is I'll take more AP courses or more IB than everybody. No, take what you can handle in a healthy way. And if you can handle the majority of it, great. If you, if you feel that that is beyond maybe your, your abilities or your interests, take what you can, try to maximize the rigor and do your best. Let's say you go to a high school that doesn't have IB or AP. And let's say it's a high school that doesn't send a lot of students to college. Uh, that's okay. Uh, one of my favorite admits was out of actually, ironically, Oregon about six years ago from Clackamas High School. It's a kind of a blue collar, basic, uh, but good American public high school. But this student, even though they didn't go to an elite high school, really had great grades. They didn't have the highest test scores. They're first gen. Uh, they were never really prepped to take the SAT or ACT, whereas some high schools really prep you well. But we just believed in this young man, and he had so many, he had his motivation, his desire to serve. And he was literally the last student we admitted into the class. So, I mean, you, you literally get to that point when you're in my job of knowing who is the last person you approve for admission. Uh, four years later, he started his uh, medical career at, med at Harvard Medical School. So here's a kid who may have seemed to be at the bottom of our pool, but when we read him and saw everything, uh, you're, not just, you're not just your numbers. And, um, and Harvard actually reached out to me because they were so pleased he was coming. They were excited about him. Um, so when you're reading these files, class performance is number one and the profile of top one or 2%. But if you go to a high school, maybe the top 10 or 15 percent would be in the top one percent of the nation if, if, if everybody went to the same high school. So we study that. And then also the rigor that you took. Also, your grade trends are your grades going up or down as you've taken more rigor. Have have your grades stayed higher or when you started taking more rigor, your grades went down. So we're looking at you as a academic performer. There And then testing, I would say the average on the ACT is probably a 34 or 35 is the median. We're right near a 35, but it's, it's probably a 34. SAT score is around 1,500. But, uh, John, I will tell you that the admit rate for students with a 34 ACT or a 1,500 is about one out of four. So students shouldn't see that average and say, oh, if I've got that, I'm in. No, but also if you're below that, don't assume I'm not going to get in. Uh, we kind of look at, are you one of the better performers in the environment you are in? Or are you at least one of the most motivated performers? 
Uh, and we're willing to do a broad view beyond a holistic view, beyond those test scores and uh, grades. This year, our admit rate for students with perfect scores was less than half. And, you know, families will call me saying, I'm stunned. I had a perfect score. How can you turn me down? It, it, you shouldn't view that one thing will automatically entitle you for admission, but also you shouldn't view that maybe a, a score that's somewhat lower or, or class performance. If there are good reasons why you want to go to a school, a top 10 or 15 school like Notre Dame, and not everything is perfect, state your case to that school and see if they'll buy into you. If they don't, they don't. Move on and go to a school that was smart enough to admit you, right? But I think students shouldn't use the numbers to decide they're, they're probably going to get in or they're probably not. Though, if you're not one of the higher level performers, these students that are applying, you saw the percentage increases in the last three years during COVID of some schools are up 25 to 80% in apps. And I think what they thought is in the chaos, people might not at my job know how to admit kids anymore. We're actually pretty smart, so we figured it out. <laughs> uh, it, it did not become a lottery. It still became a very kind of holistic, careful system of selection. So, you know, at the end, I, I do think class performance, your national test scores, uh, we're test optional. So about half of our applicant pool submitted tests. The other half chose not to. Uh, we did a research project with a lot of the top schools over the last year. It, it's kind of interesting to me that of the half that did not turn in a test score, most of them this year actually took it, but they opted not to submit it. One fifth of those students had a 1480 to 1600 or a 34, 35 or 36 on the ACT. Why they thought that was not a number they could submit, uh, I, d I don't understand that. Uh, but so, you know, what I would tell you is, you know, post the best performance that you can, uh, but have your own value system. Uh, what we want to do is see in, the, in what you've decided you want to prioritize, how well have you done? So we're as interested in your motivation as your outcomes. Well, we appreciate that. And thank you so much for sharing that 50% of the applicants did in fact submit a test score and 50% did not. And also, I like that you talked about the question, are you one of the best performers in the environment where you are right now? So I'm sure with hundreds, if not thousands of different high schools that you have to evaluate from, I'm sure the school profile, Don, correct, becomes a big part of the overall process just to know, mm -hmm. does the school offer AP, IB? Is there a limit in terms of how many of those courses that a student may take? So I know that the school profile is also a big piece. And you mentioned the GPA in the beginning, and I was curious, do you use the student's GPA as indicated on their transcript, or do you recalculate it? And if you, in fact, recalculate it, any insight that you could share in terms of how you do so would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, we use the weighted GPA that the high school provides. Uh, sometimes they'll provide both the unweighted and weighted. We tend to use the weighted. We do not reclassify or recalculate a GPA. There are so many different GPAs in this country now. And also, quite frankly, there's a very different distribution of grade giving. Uh, when I was a freshman in 1973, there's this national survey uh, that produces the report from the UCLA CERT program at UCLA Higher Ed. And it's a national report on the American college freshman. And one of the first questions it asks is in high school, were you an A plus, A, A minus, B plus, B, predominantly, which grade represents your record? And in 1973, the students going to colleges in America with a four-year college uh, being their, their first uh, enrollment, about 7% said they had an A or A-plus average, and 7% said they had an A-minus average. So 14% 14, 14 had an A-minus average or higher. Today, that's close to 60%. So high schools have made the decision to give a lot more A's, and I get parents on the phone very upset saying, I can't believe you turned down my child. They have straight A's, they have a 4-0. And yet we, through our own research on the school, 
we have found that maybe a third or 40% of all the students have that average or above. So there are just too many A's out there for a family or a student to say, well, I have straight A's. So, you know, the question is how many other students at your school have that? And then how competitive is your school? So it, we really can't trust a single GPA because one school's 4.0 is another school's 3.8 or 3.6. Uh, so we're really looking at the context of the talent at your high school and how well you're doing within that talent. If your high school provides class rank, that's the most accurate thing for us to get. About two thirds of the high school do not provide class rank anymore, but about half of those provide the distribution of grades. So you can estimate generally where you are in the class. And a third of the high schools say, good luck colleges, we're not gonna tell you anything about our grades. We're not gonna tell you how many get different grades. We're not gonna give you rank. And so then the, you, what you have to do is look at the history of all your applicants from that school and see what students in the past you've admitted and how well they've done at your, your college, which is an enormous amount of work to do. But apparently the high schools have decided for whatever their reasons are that they don't want the colleges to have uh, what I would consider to be reasonable information on class performance in the context of the school. But that's fine. Uh, we try not to penalize the students who the high school refuses to give us a, a class rank or a distribution of grades, we try very hard not to penalize. But honestly, I think the high schools that refuse to give a grade distribution at least or a class rank to some degree may be disadvantaging their applicants. But having said that, I think the deans at the most selective schools would all reassure you, and I will too, we work very hard to make sure we don't do that. Um, right. Right. But there, there is a conversation in the country going on. Should, uh, should there be an organization that does try to standardize grades and from a macro standpoint, put it on a 4-0 scale? And you know, we'll, we'll see if, if the colleges and the high schools can ever put that system together. But right now, there is no such system that I know of that I would use. Well, it's a very interesting conversation, and what I'll add to it is the fact that in many cases, just to use simple numbers, if a college has 1,000 spots to offer, perhaps they accept whatever the yield they think is going to be. So maybe they accept 4,000 people and put X amount of students on a wait list, and of course, what makes it more complicated for the colleges on your end, from what I'm told, is that the yield shifts every year, so you don't know just how many students are actually going to attend if you accept them. And so to make it even more interesting, if you look at the students that don't get accepted, their profiles, their middle 50% might not be that different than the middle 50% of the admitted class. So, yeah, you know, true. with the test optional movement, with the ease of applying, thanks to things like the Common App, the Coalition App, more and more students are applying more and more students that are viable candidates are applying. And at the end of the day, the colleges have whatever seats it is. So if you have a thousand seats, you can't accept and enroll 5,000 as an example. Right. So it's a very complicated but interesting conversation. I appreciate it so much. And speaking of applying, what are the different ways a student may apply to Notre Dame? And is there a benefit, Don, to applying one way over the other? Sure. Um, as we get to that, one thing just to make sure that some of your uh, people listening in or watching, about half of our applicants have not submitted testing. About 65% of our admits and enrolled students have submitted testing. Got it. So people might look at that and say, ah, so there is an advantage to submitting the test. Not really. It's just that there's a correlation. The students with the highest test scores are the ones most likely to submit test scores. And students with the highest test scores, not completely, but disproportionately, they're more likely to be the top class performers in the classroom. Got so it. We, we don't discriminate for or against you, whether you, you submit a score or not. It's your overall talent that we assess within there. But there is somewhat of a correlation with high test scores, high class performance, but not as much as everybody thinks. We certainly see a fair number of high ability, high performing students 
whose test scores are either not submitted to us or they're somewhat lower, but we're willing to look way beyond the test score to judge greatness. So uh, now there are two application kind of dates. There's the early action at Notre Dame, which is what we call restricted early action. And then there's regular action. All we ask for in restricted early action is you cannot apply to Notre Dame restricted early action if you're applying early decision to another school. So when I was at Cornell, we had early decision. Our view at Cornell was we're only interested in you picking one school to apply early for. And if we admit you, then uh, you have to come. I mean, it, it, you get to come, right? You're all excited. Cornell was your first choice. Uh, but it is a contract between the applicant and the college if you're early decision. Notre Dame, we've decided for a variety of our own reasons, we want to give the students a little bit more freedom of movement. So we have restricted early action that you can apply to Notre Dame, provided you've not applied early decision anywhere else. Because quite frankly, we don't want to be second choice. We don't think the students who come to Notre Dame view Notre Dame as a uh, other good. You know, it is their, their primary focus. Uh, but if you apply early and you get into Notre Dame, you are still free to apply in the regular action process to any other school in America. And if you get in there and turn Notre Dame down, that's fine. You're just not as smart as we thought you were, right? <laughs> uh, but, you know, in all fairness, there are students that, you know, they, they love Notre Dame but and they get in, but they're still encouraged uh, to, to look at their other options. We think that's a healthy. About 70% of our early action admits actually follow through and enroll at Notre Dame. Uh, last year, we had just under 10,000 early action applications out of those 26,509 apps. Uh, we admitted about 1,640 or 50 of those students, and out of that, you know, 70 some odd percent enrolled. So they represented maybe a little bit more than half of our enrolled class. In addition, though, we deferred about 1,700 students that we thought were close. And in the end, we uh, offered about 150 of those students during regular action. We offered them admission. My advice, if you apply early to any of your colleges and you get deferred, is send them a nice email, not an angry email saying, I don't understand why you, you don't didn't make the right decision. You want to say, look, I respect that it's a very hard place to get in. I want to reaffirm that your college is still my top choice. And then update us with any accomplishments or thoughts that you have. Uh, but rebound from that setback and impress us with your resilience. Don't get outraged and angry. And, and you know, if you do that, it's kind of predictable how we're going to calculate that into your application going <laughs> down the road. It's not impressive. Uh, so be, stay positive and, and just update them. Uh, if you get turned down early, you cannot reapply. So right. we're, we're actually, right. we're doing a terrible thing to you be, to be nice to you. We're, we're trying to tell you, you know, as great as you are and as much as your family loves you, we're going to offer this spot to somebody else. And it's better for you and your emotional health to start focusing on your other choices. And it is a disappointment. There are a lot of students that grow up always wanting to go to Notre Dame, but at least it allows you to start building your energy and positive thoughts towards another school. Because you deserve when you graduate in May or June to have had some time to really get excited about where you're going. And so I think getting turned down early actually gives you time to reset your, your goals and get excited and not finish your senior year kind of uh, as, as defeated, right? right. Uh, the other part of it is if you apply regular, uh, you have you have till January 1st to apply regular. Early, I think it's November 1st. But if you apply regular, you hear by around March 20th and you have till May 1st to decide. If you've been admitted early, you still have till May 1st to decide. Also, we'll put together your financial aid packages. Probably about half of our students uh, receive a financial aid package. Uh, it's very important to the majority of those students. 
that that aid package provides them the ability to come. What I'm proud about is that our regular action admits uh, yield at over a 50% rate. A lot of the top most selective schools yield at about a 20 to 35% rate in their regular action. Right. So, so oftentimes Notre Dame, what we've told you is if you apply early decision to a school, in part, you've done that to try to get a small advantage in the process. Right. And those colleges will kind of wink at you and say, yeah, if you apply early, it on the very thinnest of margins improve your chances. But boy, do people want to believe that one will be them. <laughs> so, so a lot of the early decision universities understand that probably on the thinnest of margins, they may prefer you over a slightly more qualified applicant who didn't choose to declare their love for, for your institution. And, you know, I think that's okay. I, we don't do that at Notre Dame, but I've been at institutions that have, and, and I think every institution should place some value. Of, does this student really see us as unique and valuable? Are they vested in us? You don't want to just be a generically ranked eighth or 13th or 18th in the nation and having your applicant pool saying, well, I think you're eighth, but if number seven admits me, of course, I'm not going to you. I'll go to <laughs> number seven. Well, there, to be honest, there is no real number seven. And there's no real number eight. Right. And if you think that, you really aren't as smart as we want you to be. <laughs> uh, you know, some people look at these ratings and think that somehow they, are, they have wisdom. No, it's just an algorithm that a company made, and to some degree, they make a lot of money by you buying into the belief that that is number seven and that's number eight. They're probably close to right. You know, the neighborhood of schools, I, I just put a cluster of schools together. But at the end, our yield rate, our total percentage of admits who enroll this year is 60%. Wow. That typically puts us in the top 10 of the country and probably six or seven of the schools that are at or above us have early decision where they lock in 100% of half their pool. Uh, we don't do that. So, you know, along with our graduation rate, as you noted, uh, the retention of freshmen and sophomore, our senior graduation rate is number one in the country. Wow. And our four-year and five-year graduation rates are number one. If you do a six-year graduation rate, we're probably in the top five. I think it's because the students really want to come to Notre Dame. And once they come, they're really vested in making it work. Um, but the, er the early action is not designed to give you an advantage in your chances for admission. It's designed to give you a convenience of, gee, I, you know, I think everything I did up to my junior years is as impressive as I'm going to do. I always tell students, if you think your senior year fall semester is going to be significantly more impressive than your junior year, then don't apply early because you want us to see that. But if you say, gee, I'm, I'm pretty much at the top of my class. I, there, there's nothing more I could do. Well, then apply early and take the shot then. And you don't have to come to that college if it's an early action school, but you get to you know pocket that admit. I would say there are a significant number of Notre Dame students that when they get admitted to Notre Dame, they don't apply anywhere else. You know, they're done. So they, right. they treat it like early decision, even though it's not. And that way they save money and time. They're done and fine. But do not apply early action to Notre Dame with the belief that it will actually improve your chances for admission over another student who applied in regular. That's not what Notre Dame's trying to do with that process. Understood. And it's astonishing that you have a 60% yield rate. That is truly amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that and so much more. Don, I was curious, demonstrated interest. What are some of the things that students do to try to demonstrate their interest in terms of wanting to attend the University of Notre Dame? And do you track such things? So for the last 25 years, there have been articles in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and they called out some of the more selective schools for tracking that and basically scoring it and, and suggesting to the public that the more demonstrated interest at some of these schools, the more likely, if you're close, they'll admit you over somebody else. Um, you know what I find interesting, John, is 
And again, I'm now retired. <laughs> <laughs> Although two weeks ago when I was not retired, I would have said this to you too. <laughs> but I think what's fascinating for me in the last 45 years is looking at the fragile egos of these elite schools. They, they seem to be more concerned over their ratings than the welfare of an 18-year-old. And I think it's, it's not great. And I think as a principal at a high school, this is not what you or I or really the college presidents want. We need to have the courage not to worry more for ourselves than the welfare of our kids applied. Sorry to call them kids. I'm 67. I'm going to call an 18-year-old a kid. But they're young adults and they're students. But I would say that the, the use of kind of express interest, I think it's useful if the students can tell us why they're interested in us. Tell us what it is about us that you think is unique, that you have a appreciation for. And if you come to our college, you will actually act on that appreciation. I always tell my staff, pick the students that will make the best use of the resources we have at Notre Dame that we want students to use, right? So, you know, the research opportunities, the entrepreneurship, uh, you know, go to the, going to the football games. Now, you don't have to promise to go to the football games, <laughs> but, you, but at Notre Dame, you do have to promise that you never, ever want to see USC get a point. <laughs> on the football field, yeah. You know? But I, generally, do you have an appreciation for that college that you can articulate and convey? That's actually more important than how many times you went to our website, uh, how many times you visited our college, uh, how well you say and state in your essay why you want to come to our university is probably more important than uh, doing this like frequent flyer type points. There are companies, and you probably are aware of this, that sell for, for some a real expense to parents, desperate parents, sad parents. Uh, oh, well, we'll hire a company to go online and pretend they're you. you. And so we'll have seven, uh, 75 contacts with this college, all done by a company, so that when they score your interest, you, you'll score really high. Wow. There are companies doing that. And I we, did, we I did yeah. not know that, Don. To be honest yeah. with you, that's what I did not know about. Yeah. And so, you know, we've become a bit jaded at the colleges about demonstrated interest. If it's all just kind of numerical of how many times did the student go online? Now, when we send an email, do you open it up? And yeah. all, it's amazing all the things you can now see. Quite frankly, at Notre Dame, I, we, and I think this is true for 90 plus percent of the, of the colleges, um, we, we might look at it, but we're not going to change and make a decision for you or against you right. because of that data. We might use it to make better use of our time efficiently as to if we have several expensive publications that we're not going to send to everybody, who do we think will probably most likely want to get it, right? Right. Uh, so we're using science in that way. But uh, a demonstrated interest, largely what I would tell students and parents articulate to the college, whether that's in your application in a Word document, either answering a question or just attach it as an additional statement of this is why I want to go to your school. Be careful not to just restate what they put on their website and in their view book. Right. We see way too many people just kind of copy our statement of why we think you should come to Notre Dame. And they write back saying, this is why I want to come. And we go, wait, that's really familiar. Oh yeah, we wrote it. So try to personalize it so that it's um, authentic, right? And again, I think it's only human nature for the top colleges, separate from my accusation of excessive ego, but it's only human for those schools to want people who want them, but want them for the right reasons. And if a lot of students say, well, you're a top 10 school or your, your business school's ranked number one in the country, or uh, I think that, you know, I, I want to go to a top 15 school and you're clearly in that group, which maybe says to me that you're applying to 15 schools. Uh, <laughs> and that's fine. I, we're just one of 15 and we don't know where we rank order in that. OK, uh, but the more you can articulate what it is, who you are and who you think we are and who might you become because you come to us. 
then we get excited for you. Then we feel like we're helping you. If you come here, you get it. You're going to use our resources the way we want our resources used. But if it's just flat out, how I have more interest, I've proven I have more interest than another student. Well, that's great. But what if we find the other student more interesting? And I, I think that the colleges have to be careful not to focus most of their selection on who will come if we admit them. Um, you know, when I've gone to hire people, I've had that argument thrown back to me. Well, we don't know if she will come or he will come if we hire her. Well, certainly if we don't hire her or him, they won't be coming. Right. And let's not get so caught up in whether we think they like us. If we like them, let's admit them and try our best to get them to like us. So we really don't look at demonstrated interest in, in the way of scoring it. But we do look at, do they intend to view Notre Dame as a unique place? And can they articulate that? Well, I appreciate that. And it's one of the reasons why we have this podcast, because we want to give that insight. We want to give that advice to the parents and students straight from people like yourself who ultimately make the decisions. So thank you so much, Don. And I know that you touched upon it, but I'm going to ask about the college essay. What are some examples of college essays that really stuck with you? And what advice would you share with prospective students in terms of what to think of when they're sitting down getting ready to write their essays? Yeah. So I have a son who is a screenplay writer, director in Hollywood. Wow. He does comedies. And when he heard my answer to this question, he said, <laughs> Dad, that's what makes a good movie. You know, the same three <laughs> points you make, and I'll make them here in just a second. Uh, so either this will help you in your college essays, or if ever you want to go to Hollywood and make a movie, uh, <laughs> both of these are take notes on this. But um, you know what? First of all, I'll tell you what is a mistaken essay to what to avoid. And that will help you understand when I tell you story of good essays. I would say as bright as the students are who to apply to all these great colleges, about 90% of the essays we see fail to be an essay. They're really a report. And they're a report on, I achieved this, I got this grade, I got these test scores. I won this award, I, I hold, I'm the president of the class, or I threw the winning touchdown pass. Now, if you threw it against USC, we're interested. But um, <laughs> other than that, you know, they're just kind of reporting on their accomplishments. It's like a treadmill of success that they're able to say they were on and they got these results. That's not really an essay. That's a report, a report of excellence, but nonetheless a report. A really good essay I would say the three elements, and I, I think this is true beyond Notre Dame, but certainly it's very true at Notre Dame. Uh, the first thing is, what is your motivation for what you're doing and what you're achieving? So what are your, what are your motivations in life right now? As best as you know yourself at age 17 or 18, what do you think you're motivated by? What are you trying to do? Who do you think you are? And then, so a good essay will whatever you choose to write about, one of the first things the reader at the college will get is kind of what is your motivation for doing things? And then are you able to reflect on anything you're doing and learn from it? So what are my motivations? Whatever I've chosen to write about, what did I learn by what I've done? And then the third point is how did that change me? How am I now going to be a better version of myself for you to admit into your college, because I've told you the story of this is why I do what I do. This is what I learned from the example I gave you to show you what my motivations are. And then thirdly, this is how it changed me and that I can now uh, really go after what you're going to provide me at your college. So John, I would say that on the essay, the ideal essays really focus on the three elements of letting the college know generally your your own sense of what motivates you. And whatever story you choose to tell them, you also want to show that that you have learned from what you're, you did. So if you're writing about working at McDonald's, well, okay, what was your motivation for doing that? And then tell us, what did you learn from that? Uh, so, or let's say it was running the, the student newspaper my senior year. 
Uh, I ran the judicial system for student behavior. Whatever the story is, what was your motivation for doing it? What did you actually learn that made you uh, a more complete person? Uh, and then how did that change you? So having chosen to speak about that, this was your motivation. This is what you learned from it. How has that now changed you? What that illustrates to a, a college is that you're willing to grow. You're willing to think through. You have motivations. You're willing to think through things. And you're willing to change as a result. And that's a very attractive profile for the colleges. So uh, a good essay is an essay. It's about you. It's not about your accomplishments. It really talks about a deeper version of you than maybe the facade of your achievements. Well, that's a great answer. And you're absolutely right. You know, in the application, the transcript talks about the courses that you took, the rigor, the grades, the activity sheet talks about what you've done over the years. But the essay is really that one opportunity that you get to really share your voice, your thought process, your own insights as a student in terms of what you've been through, how you reflected, what did you learn from it, and what do you intend to do to grow even further. So another piece of the overall application are the teacher letters of recommendation. So what are you looking for in terms of helping to enhance an application from the teacher's letters? And of course, if you could share an example, we'd appreciate it, Don. Sure. I think that, first of all, when you're picking your teachers, it's not necessary to pick the teacher who taught you the class that you got your highest grade in. In fact, it's sometimes pretty good to pick the teacher where maybe you struggled in the class, but you ultimately triumphed. So um, I think that, first of all, who you pick should not just be about your highest grade that you achieve or your greatest mastery in something. If it was because that's what you're really proud of, that's great. But I would focus on what can that teacher say about you? First of all, I'm interested when I read the recommendations from teacher, I'd like the teacher to describe to me what sort of learner is the student? Are they motivated? We get back to the word motivation. Are they motivated by achievement? Are they motivated by learning? Are they just a curious? What is it from the teacher's point of view that makes this student really special? And so I want the teacher to give me their attitude towards learning. I often say, you know, after reading so many applications, I no longer think it's sufficient for you to prove that you're better at thinking than somebody else. What I'm interested in is whether you like to think. Because people who like to think actually spend more time thinking uh, than, than the average person. So can a teacher tell me what is it about your personality as a learner that they've really seen and admired? And maybe they would tell us is somewhat unique. And they may use an example of this student really struggled in my physics class, but they were absolutely determined to master, you know, the, the, uh, the mechanics of you know, whatever you want to describe in physics. I should be more exact. My wife is a physics teacher and she'd be <laughs> saying, give them this example right now. But, um, you know, I, I think the, the faculty members' comments on kind of your attitude towards learning, your resilience, and even your, your determination to overcome something you didn't understand. Secondly, I want the teacher to tell me what sort of citizen you are in the classroom to your classmates as a student? You know, are you helpful to other students in their learning process? Or are you just there trying to prove you're smarter than everybody else in the room? You know, is it a kind of a conquering attitude that you have? Or are you somebody that's trying to make the room smarter, not prove you're the smartest person in the room? So are you a generous person? And then thirdly, separate from the classroom, does the teacher have an opinion of you as a citizen at the school? and maybe even as a citizen within the community. So if, if you become a kind of a three or four dimensional person, you're not just an achiever in their classroom, uh, that's nice for us to hear that from the teachers. Well, we appreciate that insight. And again, that's a great answer. Thank you so much, Don. And of course, the Students Activity Sheet is yet another piece of the overall application. Don, what are some of the things you're looking for beyond the work that they did in the classroom? So I think as I've looked at the, the decades of reading applications, <laughs> the 
the students, I think, have been sometimes misled to believe that if they do 30 things, that's better than three things. It's not. I'm interested in the depth of your commitment to something. Now, I, I certainly am happy that you might do 10 things, but don't list everything you've done marginally. List the most important things that were things that were most important to you. And then talk to us about, again, your motivation. Why did you do those things? What did you learn from doing them? How has that enhanced your life? And you, you might decide to say, well, these three things I did, I really want to continue at college in my life. These other four things, that is worth doing. I'm not going to keep doing them, but I learned something from them. You don't have to focus on seven things. Pick one or two to list a couple of activities. Mention how much commitment you made to them, how much time you put into it, and then as much as possible, why you joined it, what you learned from it. And then maybe make sure that you've picked the, the most important activity and you've spent a little bit more time fleshing that one out for us. Is you know how, how does that make us feel like we know you better and we're more impressed by you? And you know that could be I make scarves and give them to the homeless. Um, I had a student from LA. She made scarves because she really likes knitting. And then she found a way to, to get them. And then she started an organization of other uh, students to do it. And then she showed herself as an entrepreneur. So she first just did it herself. But then, well, did she do that to impress the colleges? Or did she do that out of a genuine? And, you know, we're, we're seeing all these uh, startup companies now, you know, some students have three startups. Apparently, one startup company that, that you've incorporated isn't enough anymore. So there seems to be an arms race out there by parents in these private college counseling firms that charge you enormous sums to try to make your student pretend there's something they're not. Well, that's great insight. Again, I really appreciate this conversation. And obviously, Don, a lot of people love Notre Dame and certainly are very fond of the movie Rudy. So I have to ask, Don, do you get a lot of questions about Rudy? <laughs> yeah, it's ironic. So I graduated from Notre Dame in 1977. In 73 and 74 football seasons, I was a football manager for Eric Parsegian. And wow. I was on the field, and I knew Rudy personally. Oh, wow. And then my, my other roommate, not from Jersey, the other roommate was an All-American high school recruit. He was an offensive lineman at Notre Dame on scholarship. And Rudy was one of his best friends. So there were certain Friday nights that I would hang out with Rudy and my, my football playing roommate for a little bit. And then I thought it got boring. So I left and did other things. <laughs> but apparently Rudy was able to make a story very interesting to the American public. Uh, he also officiated a lot of sporting events uh, to, for pay. So I think the majority of the movie Rudy is pretty accurate. And I admire Rudy. Wow. And I admired that he wasn't, and they portrayed in the movie, he maybe wasn't as accomplished in certain ways as other people. But look at what he ultimately accomplished. So I think Rudy's a great story for Americans to view that it's not just about your test scores and your grades. There's the ambition, the motivation, and the heart that he showed and the soul that he showed in that. By the way, it took him like 10 years to get that script written in there. So he did another Rudy to get his movie made. You know, wow. he, he was pestering everybody <laughs> to let him be on the team in there. And then he pestered everybody to, you know, to do it. And when I say pestered, I, I hope that's not derogatory towards Rudy. I, he's, he's somebody I really like and admire and he loves Notre Dame. Um, and that is one of the great movies of all time for kids growing up. So uh, Notre Dame's delighted that that movie got made. And so here is one of our most accomplished uh, graduates probably getting rejected three or four times before getting into Notre Dame. Yeah. Well, he showed a lot of grit, obviously never giving up. And uh, it's interesting that you talk about everything that he did to ultimately get on that football team, but also then afterwards. To Same get behavior the movie pattern. Made. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So those yeah. are great lessons for the students and even parents listening out there. So we appreciate that, Don. And this has been a phenomenal conversation. Thank you so much. And so, Don, in conclusion, what are your top three pieces of advice that you would give students and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? 
So number one, keep your dignity in this process. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think that there is such an irrational exuberance over getting into college, getting the highest test scores, getting all the right courses and grades in high school. I, I fear that our high school generation in the last 20 years has spent more time of their high school years trying to get into college than spending the four years constructively having the high school experience they deserve. So first of all, keep your dignity and your sense of proportion and focus your four years of high school on living those four years fully and well. And just know that the college process, senior year, and even a little bit junior year, just manage some time to do it, but don't over-focus on the next step. Make sure you finish off high school well. So keep your dignity. Uh, don't listen to everybody else's view of what, you know, what the numbers are and who admits who. D don't get caught up in that. Just be yourself. And any school that's not smart enough to admit you, don't worry about them. Move on. Right. Uh, number two, um, I think there are a lot of organizations out there trying to get you and your parents to pay them to present you as a package. Don't do that. In fact, you know, they want to help you write your essays. They want to help you write about your activities. Some of them will even orchestrate your activities junior and senior year so that it looks like you did something. And then we get, we get you know, the same company. We'll see 20 students did the, exactly the same thing and then have written essentially the same thing about doing those things. And then we know that you've kind of bought and packaged yourself. Um, why would you pay that much money to what I call failed Ivy League graduates? Because if this is what they're doing their career, they have clearly failed. And why would you do that? Or if you hire a company that uh, has hype that they've hired former admission officers from all these elite schools. Again, if that's what our admission officers did after leaving us, they're not moving up, they're going down. So I really want to say, do not pay for people to package you. Just do your best of presenting yourself and be your authentic self and know that that's more impressive than any image that you can try. And then the last thing I would say is we've all kind of lost the opportunity when we're a senior and an 18 year old to use, you ought to look at college and think about what is college going to do for me? What, what are those four years meant to be? We're so focused on getting into a college that's rated in a certain way. We should spend most of our energy just saying, I need to understand what college is. What happens at college that makes that four years so much uh, more better than me spending four years you know, working? Or, or say, what is it that college will do for me? And, and how could I kind of evaluate myself of becoming a better version of myself you know, talk to employers uh, five years, 10 years after college. What are you looking for in college students that you're hiring? Get Find out what are the so-called successful stories of college graduates and find out what is college supposed to do for you, right? As opposed to just focusing on which college should I apply to and get in. Learn what college in general, regardless of where you go, should be. And then pick the school where your personality and those goals kind of merge into the better version of yourself. Is that helpful? That is more than helpful. Those are tremendous pieces of advice. Your insight today has been phenomenal. Don, I cannot thank you enough. And I'm so happy because I know that this conversation is going to help so many students and their parents navigating through the college admissions process. I cannot thank you enough. Don, we hope to have you again. John, thanks very much. Our pleasure. Thank you, Don. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.